Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm <clears throat> delighted that you're joining today to help me focus on Langston Hughes, an incredibly important and influential American writer, African American, <clears throat> whose influence uh, then, as well as now, has been profound. And in the next 45 minutes, I hope to <clears throat> give an overview of his life, his legacy, his influence. And then uh, I'll be reading a number of his poems because it is impossible to really gain significant access to Lin Langston Hughes without really coming to terms with his poetry. Uh, if you get very interested in Hughes, I suggest you take a look at this big book, which comprehends all of his poetry. It's the Collected Poems of Langston Hughes, edited by Arnold Rampersstad, who is his chief biographer. It's a big book. <clears throat> it's about 800 pages. But his poetry is very accessible, as I'll hope to show in just a minute. <clears throat> Langston Hughes, I think, has come immediately into vogue because of the Black <clears throat> Lives Matter movement. Uh, we're all experiencing now in America <clears throat> incredible turbulence. Uh, which hasn't yet settled. Uh, but I just want to point out that Langston Hughes, uh, born in the 19th century, uh, died in 1967 at the age of 66 in Harlem, predated uh, the Black Pride movement, predated the Black is Beautiful movement, uh, predated the Black Power movement, predated uh, Black cultural uh, effervescence uh, predated all this, uh, now getting near almost 100 years ago. Uh, he was <clears throat> primarily a poet, but he was a novelist, he was a short story writer, he was an essayist, <clears throat> he was a columnist, he was a journalist, he was certainly a social activist, <clears throat> and he was a playwright, and he actually wrote opera libretti, uh, the most significant being the libretto for Street Scene, a wonderful American opera with music written by Kurt Weill. Langston Hughes <clears throat> was born in the Midwest in Joplin, Missouri, and he grew up <clears throat> in a series of Midwestern towns, finally completing high school in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, this peripatetic wandering and growing up in the Midwest towns was because of his very unstable family life. His father literally abandoned the family, disappeared, and ended up living in Mexico for the rest of his life. His father was a very strange man, uh, <clears throat> feeling <clears throat> on his part of a contempt for American Blacks who suffered persecution without fighting back strongly enough. Langston Hughes' mother was emotionally unstable, uh, very difficult for her to hold a job, much less function effectively as a mother. Uh, he was an amazingly precocious poet, a prolific writer in general at a very early age. And as a matter of fact, one of his most significant poems, <clears throat> The Negro Looks at Rivers, was written when he was only 17 years old. This is a poem that some of you may be familiar with. The Negro speaks of rivers. I've known rivers. I've known rivers ancient as the world and older than the flow of human blood in human veins. My soul has grown deep like the rivers. I bathed in the Euphrates when dawns were young. <clears throat> I built my hut near the Congo and it lulled me to sleep. I looked upon the Nile and raised the pyramids above it. I heard the singing of the Mississippi when Abe Lincoln <clears throat> went down to New Orleans. And I've seen its muddy bosom turn all golden in the sunset. I've known rivers, ancient dusky rivers, my soul has grown deep like the rivers. 
written at the age of 17. <clears throat> After high school, Langston Hughes literally spent a year with his father in Mexico, uh, presumably in an effort to uh, understand and come into physical contact with a man who was in effect a total stranger. Uh, the relationship did not go well. <clears throat> his father was a very rigid, judgmental, very angry man. <clears throat> uh, he told Hughes that he could go to Columbia University in New York, which Hughes was desperate to do, <clears throat> only if he agreed to study engineering. Uh, his father had total contempt for his ambition as a poet and a writer. Hughes agreed, enrolled at Columbia University, his first introduction to New York City, but dropped out after a year, <clears throat> knowing that engineering was not for him. He finally finished his college degree a few years later at Lincoln University, a black college in Lincoln, Pennsylvania. And one of his classmates was Thurgood Marshall, later became, of course, Supreme Court Justice. At a very early age, Hughes gained a kind of literary notable reputation after publishing a number of poems in the Crisis magazine, which was the official publishing arm of the NAACP, National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. And he became a kind of minor celebrity in the Harlem community, which at that time was, of course, the key central Black community in America. Uh, he ended up settling in Harlem, where he lived the rest of his adult life. He had an apartment that he kept for years on 135th Street. And it's the apartment in which he died of pneumonia at the age of 66 in 1967. <clears throat> Langston Hughes, as I think some of you may know, is the main <clears throat> celebrated voice of the Harlem Renaissance, a fascinating 10-year cultural explosion of Black <clears throat> literature, Black art, Black music, Black fashion, uh, Black poetry, Black dance, <clears throat> all centered in Harlem in Manhattan. <clears throat> during the heyday, which lasted between 1919 and I would say as late as 1934, at the height of the depression. Uh, it was Langston Hughes that coined the phrase when the Negro was in vogue, <clears throat> which was later paraphrased as when Harlem was in vogue. Like many African-Americans, <clears throat> Langston Hughes had a mixed, racial ancestry. Uh, <clears throat> this is something that a lot of white people today really do not understand. Uh, Langston Hughes' paternal grandmothers were slaves and both his paternal grandfathers were white slave owners in Kentucky. Hughes was haunted all of his life by this mixed racial ancestry. His most famous play, Mulatto, and some of his most famous poems address this issue in very powerful and poignant terms. Uh, one of the most well-known poems is called Cross. My old man's a white old man and my old mother's black. If ever I curse my white old man, I take my curses back. If ever I curse my black old mother and wish that she were in hell, I'm sorry for that evil wish. And now I wish her well. My old man died in a fine big house. My mother died in a shack. I wonder where I'm gonna die being neither white nor black. His mother, incapable of functioning as a mother to him, put him in the custodial protection of his grandmother, Mary Langton, his maternal grandmother, and she really raised him in Lawrence, 
Kansas. Uh, Mary Langton was an interesting, <clears throat> very strong-willed woman who instilled in Langston Hughes a very strong sense of racial pride. Interestingly, Mary Langston's first husband was a man named Sheridan Leary, who participated in John Brown's raid at Harper's Ferry and was killed in that attack. Uh, his grandmother <clears throat> kept his bullet-ridden coat for the rest of her life, and she often <clears throat> would put the coat on sleeping Langston Hughes during the night. <clears throat> uh, Hughes received a passionate feeling about racial pride from his grandmother, as well as a feeling of empathy for the downtrodden, <clears throat> the poor, disadvantaged, the dispossessed, and he glorified his fellow Blacks throughout all of his work. Just to give a couple of examples, a short poem called My People. The night is beautiful, so the faces of my people. The stars are beautiful, so the eyes of my people. Beautiful also is the sun, Beautiful also are the souls of my people. What's interesting about Hughes is that he restrained himself throughout his life and career from hating white people. Here's a short poem that illustrates his attempt to keep his emotions under human control. The White Ones, it's called. I do not hate you, for your faces are beautiful too. I do not hate you. Your faces are whirling lights of loveliness and splendor too. Yet, why do you torture me, oh white strong ones? Why do you torture me? One of Hughes' most famous poems, often anthologized, is a poem you may be familiar with. It's called Mother to Son. A mother speaks to her son. Well, son, I'll tell you, life for me ain't been no crystal stair. It's had tacks in it and splinters and boards torn up and places with no carpet on the floor, bare. But all the time I's been a climbing on and reaching landings and turning corners and sometimes going in the dark where there ain't been no light. So boy, don't you turn back. Don't you sit down on the steps because you finds it kind of hard. Don't you fall now. For I'm still going, honey. I'm still climbing. And life for me ain't been no crystal stair. Dream variations. To fling my arms wide in some place of the sun, to whirl and to dance till the white day is done. Then rest at cool evening beneath a tall tree while night comes on gently, dark, like me. That is the dream. To fling my arms wide in the face of the sun, dance, whirl, whirl, till the quick day is done. Rest at pale evening, a tall, slim tree. Night coming tenderly, black like me. Hughes spent most of his childhood in, childhood in Lawrence, Kansas. Uh, <clears throat> if you're interested in Langston Hughes, I strongly suggest uh, you buy his two volume autobiography. I went uh, through every word. I found it incredible reading. Uh, the first volume was called The Big C. 
the second volume, I Wonder Where I Wonder. <clears throat> In his 1940 autobiography, The Big C, he wrote about his childhood with his grandmother. <clears throat> I was unhappy for a long time and very lonesome living with my grandmother. Then it was that books began happening to me and I began to believe in nothing but books and the wonderful world of books where if people suffered, they suffered in beautiful language and not in monosyllables as we did in Lawrence. His writing experiments really began when he was in grammar school. Hughes was elected class poet. He stated that in retrospect, he thought <clears throat> it was because of the stereotypes about African-Americans having rhythm in his own words, I was a victim of a stereotype. There were only two of us <clears throat> Negro kids in the whole class and our English teacher was always stressing the importance of rhythm in poetry. Well, <clears throat> everybody knows, except black people, that all Negroes <clears throat> have rhythm. So they elected me class poet. As an adult, even while still attending college, Langston Hughes had a various number of odd jobs. He served as a seaman aboard a boat called the SS Malone in 1923. <clears throat> and he spent six months traveling through West Africa and Europe. In Africa, <clears throat> Hughes was astonished to realize that black Africans considered him a white man because of his comparatively light skin and his smooth, dark hair. He had a brief, fascinating residence in Paris. He was totally broke. He was penniless. He was often on the verge of starvation. He lived hand to mouth, but somehow survived and finally connected with the Bohemian life in Paris and with other black expatriates at that time living in Paris to escape persecution in Jim Crow, Southern America. <clears throat> in his autobiographies, uh, he spends a lot of time talking about his fascinating year in the Soviet Union, <clears throat> 1934, where he was part of a large delegation of black Americans brought to the Soviet Union by the Soviet government in order to make a propaganda film. Uh, the film never was completed, uh, but it gave Hughes an opportunity to see for an entire year uh, life uh, in the revolutionary new country called the Soviet Union. He was both impressed and disillusioned. Uh, he made trips to Japan and to China. And he participated in the Spanish Civil War as a journalist, covering the side of the loyalists <clears throat> as opposed to the fascists. He was in Madrid <clears throat> during the final days of the Civil War when Madrid was under heavy, heavy bombardment by the fascists. And he left the city just before it fell to Franco and his troops. Hughes' first book of poetry that was published was called The Weary Blues, 1926. And it reflected his embrace of a new literary genre, which he dubbed jazz poetry, the blues. You can't understand Langston Hughes without having some sense of the blues, which is essentially an African-American cultural form. It's what the African-Americans contributed to American culture. It's really the embodiment of the Black response to the Black experience in America. It's the philosophy of Black life in song. Let me quote Langston Hughes. Gay songs, because you had to be gay or die. 
sad songs because you couldn't help being sad sometimes. But Geyer said, you kept on living. You kept on going. Arnold Rapper said, the chief biographer of Hughes said that Langston Hughes, perhaps more than any other American poet, was incredibly attentive and sensitive to music. To him, black music at its best was not merely entertainment, it was the metronome of African-American racial grace. And again, let me quote Langston Hughes. Like the waves of the sea coming one after another, always one after another, like the earth moving around the sun, night, day, night, day, night, day. So is the undertow of black music with its rhythm that never betrays you, its strength like the beat of a human heart, its humor and its rooted power. Let me give you just two examples. He wrote hundreds of poems, blues. First one is Bound North Blues. <clears throat> going down the road, Lord, going down the road. Down the road, Lord, way, way down the road. Got to find somebody to help me carry this load. Roads in front of me, nothing to do but walk. Roads in front of me, walk and walk and walk. I'd like to meet a good friend to come along and talk. Hates to be lonely. Lord, I hates to be sad. Says I hates to be lonely. I hates to be lonely and sad. But every friend you find seems like they try to do you bad. Road, 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 oh, road, 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 oh. On the northern road, these Mississippi towns ain't fit for a hopping head. Lonesome place. I got to leave this town, it's a lonesome place. Got to leave this town cause <clears throat> it's a lonesome place. A poor, poor boy can't find a friendly face. Going down to the river, flowing deep and slow. Going down to the river deep and slow cause there ain't no worries where the waters go. I'm weary, weary. Weary as I can be, weary, weary, weary as can be. This life so weary is about to overcome me. Let's put our attention now to the Harlem Renaissance. Uh, a huge cultural experience in American history lasted for essentially 10, 12 years. Some of the most famous names, Zora Neale Hurston, Claude McKay, Paul Lawrence Dunbar, County Cullen, James Weldon John, Carl Van Vechten. <clears throat> the heart of the Harlem Renaissance was a surging pride in the black race, a celebration of black history, Black music, Black dance, Black song, Black art, Black fashion. Not only in Harlem, which was the center of Black culture in America, but throughout the world. Here is Hughes' own take on the Harlem Renaissance and his involvement in it. My seeking has been to explain and illuminate the Negro condition in America and obliquely that of all humankind. Uh, what is relevant to the African-American is ultimately relevant to all of humanity. Langston Hughes was a key influential factor in a very important movement called Negritude. 
which is explained in his own words as follows. <clears throat> An aesthetic by black writers internationally suffused by an African sensibility, radically different from the European colonial sensibility. Hughes went on to explain, Negritude is a synthesis of the essence of Negro folk art redistilled, particularly the old music and its flavor, the ancient beat out of Africa, the folk rhymes, Ashanti tales, revealing to the Negro people and the world the beauty within themselves. Hughes inspired some of the most important international Black writers of the 20th century. Leopold Senghor of Senegal, Jacques Wimane of Haiti, Aimé Césaire of Martinique, Jean Damza of the French Vienna and Nicolas Guillen became the national poet of Cuba. Hughes wrote what became really the official credo of the Harlem Renaissance. Let me read it to you. The younger Negro artists who create now intend to express our individual dark-skinned selves without fear or shame. If white people are pleased, we are glad. If they are not, it doesn't matter. We know we are beautiful and ugly too. The Tom Tom cries and the Tom Tom laughs. If colored people are pleased, we are glad. If they are not, their displeasure doesn't matter either. We build our temples for tomorrow, strong as know-how, and we stand on top of a mountain, free within ourselves. His poetry, his short stories, his novels, his essays, his columns, all portray the lives of working class Black people full of strong joy, laughter, music, sorrow, tears, tragedy. 1943, he creates one of his most famous characters, Jesse B. Semple, S-E-M-P-L-E, -E, known later as Simple, uh, a kind of average Harlemite with an interesting perspective <clears throat> on everyday events, as well as national events. He wrote ultimately five novels with Jesse Semple at the center. Langston Hughes confronted racial stereotypes and protested against social conditions, particularly Jim Crowism and the unspeakable horrors of lynching. He literally expanded African America's image of itself. And it was without any kind of self-hate and really without overt hatred for the white oppressor. One of the few prominent writers at that time to champion racial consciousness as a sole inspiration to black artists. He predated the 60s, he predated the civil rights movement, he predated the Black is Beautiful movement by decades. Now the Renaissance was triggered by two events. One was the publication of a very, very important anthology of essays by young black writers, edited by Alain Locke, <clears throat> one of the foremost black intellectuals of the 1920s. The book came out in 1925 and it was called The New Negro. At the same time, um, County Cull came up with the most famous action poem of that time, uh, triggered by an event that even I was unfamiliar with, quite frankly, and I studied Black 
history and literature most of my life. Uh, the event that triggered off <clears throat> the poem that I'll read in just a moment, If We Must Die, is referred to now by historians as the Red Summer. Uh, in place in 1919, right after the end of World War I, <clears throat> it took place in the late winter and early autumn of 1919. White supremacists <clears throat> conducted attacks on black people in more than 40 cities and towns throughout America. And in one rural county in Arkansas, James Weldon Johnson, one of the most prominent black writers of the time, dubbed the event Red Summer because of two reasons, the sheer flow of blood. And secondly, because one of the triggers was the aftermath of the Bolshevik Revolution in the Soviet Union. The worst attack took place in Elaine County in Arkansas where an estimated 250 black people were massacred by white supremacists. Uh, what caused it? A number of reasons. As I hope you know, it was a massive exodus of black people from the South after World War I. About two million black people left the South to go North to escape Jim Crowism. And they began to fill up whole sections of cities like Detroit and Chicago. St. Louis. Secondly, there was an economic slump and economic times and economic stress. As we are seeing, we speak, uh, produces social turmoil, often racial turmoil. Uh, we have at the same time the demobilization of thousands of black soldiers who fought in World War I and came home from the war without jobs and facing the same persecution that they faced before they entered the war. <clears throat> there was a fight for job housing, particularly amongst poor whites and poor blacks. There was labor unrest. There was the Red Scare, that you know something about. The first Red Scare in America took place after World War I. The second Red Scare took place after World War II, ending with the trial and execution of the Rosenberg. First Red Scare ended in 1926 with the trial and execution of Sacco and Benzetti. The poem by Claude McKay, If We Must Die, you should know this poem. If we must die, let it not be like hogs hunted and penned in an inglorious spot. While well, round us arc the mad and hungry dogs making their mock at our accursed lot. If we must die, oh, let us nobly die, so that our precious blood may not be shed in vain, then even the monsters we defy shall be constrained to honor us, though dead. Oh, kinsmen, we must meet the common foe, though far outnumbered, let us show us brave, and for their thousand blows deal one death blow. What though before us lies the open grave, like men will face the murderous cowardly pack, pressed to the wall, dying, but fighting back. Hughes and the aim of the Harlem Renaissance was to challenge the prevailing racism in America and the stereotyping of black people, <clears throat> hopefully to promote progressive politics and racial and social integration. <clears throat> the creation of black art and music and fashion and design and song and music would hopefully foster a positive internal and external image. White people during the Harlem Renaissance poured into anxious to see and participate and experience this exotic outburst of aspect of American culture. 
Uh, they frequented nightclubs, most particularly the Cotton Club, which I'm sure you've heard about, where they delighted in the jazz rhythms of UB Blake, <clears throat> Jelly Roll Morton, Fats Waller, Ethel Waters, Adelaide Hall, Florence Mills. They listened to band leaders like Duke Ellington, Louis Armstrong, and Fletcher Henderson. Ironically, the Cotton Club featured Black performers but forbade entry to any Black patron. One of the incredible ironies of the Renaissance. Uh, it said that the Harlem Renaissance really laid the foundation for post-World War II civil rights movement of the 60s and the 50s. It changed the image of Black people in America from uneducated, crude, lowly peasants to sophisticated, urban, uh, intellectuals and artists. And Langston Hughes was the most famous voice in this movement. His fame extended far beyond America, as I said before. His name was prominent in France, in the Soviet Union, and particularly in Japan. Yet, as reputation grew, he came into conflict with younger Black writers. This is not at all unusual. There were some writers at that time who thought of Langston Hughes as a racial chauvinist, uh, a kind of separatist, a kind of isolationist at a time when integration would be the prevailing norm. Uh, on the other hand, Hughes considered some of the younger writers, particularly James Baldwin, with whom he had altercations, to be black, black pride over intellectual and somewhat crooked at times and vulgar. He sympathized with the Black Power movement, but he had severe criticism of what he considered the extreme anger of the younger leaders of the movement. But he continued to have admirers in the community. Uh, he was incredibly generous. He is credited with discovering writers like Alice Walker, the author of the Better Purple. He helped many Black writers gain access to important people in publishing. And one of the young Black writers at that time, Lofton Mitchell, explained his admiration of Hughes. Langston set a tone, a standard of brotherhood and friendship and cooperation for all of us. He never stopped thinking about the rest of us. Hughes became very controversial in the 50s because like many black intellectuals, he was drawn to communism as an alternative to segregated America. He was frequently published in the Communist Party newspaper. He was involved in a number of communist-led causes, uh, in particular, the fight to save the Scottsboro Boys. I assume most of you are familiar with this scandalous episode in American social. And of course, he participated in the struggle on behalf of the loyalists against the fascists in Spain. But he was more of a sympathizer than an active participant. Uh, in the 50s, during the second Red Scare, <clears throat> he was accused of being a communist by many on the far right. He always denied it. And when someone once asked him, how come you never joined the Communist Party? He said the Communist Party was based on strict discipline and the acceptance of directives that I did not wish to accept. An excellent response. <clears throat> Uh, I assume that some of you at one point tipped into one of the most important post-World War II nonfiction publications, The God That Failed, um, the, the testimony of six writers and intellectuals who were members at one point of the Communist Party who broke loose from it for precisely the reasons that Langston Hughes just gave, uh, the crushing of individual thought. Uh, on behalf of party structure. 
impossible for someone like Langston Hughes to talk. 1953, Langston Hughes was called before the Senate Permanent Subcommittee on Investigation, led by Senator Joseph McCarthy. Under heavy scrutiny, he testified as follows. Never read the theoretical books of socialism or communism, or for that matter, the Democratic and National Parties. And so my interest in whatever may be considered political has been non-theoretical, non-sectarian, and largely emotional, and born out of my own need to find some way of thinking about the whole problem of myself. Uh, most of the poetry that he wrote with a strong uh, left-wing Communist Party tinge is not easy to find anymore, <clears throat> but one in particular is called A New Song, which is included in this anthology of his collected poetry, where he calls on the workers of the world to unite with <clears throat> the Black people, with the Jewish people, with the other outcasts of the social norm and inclusion, and fight for a new world of freedom. <clears throat> Hughes died in 1967, <clears throat> but it's amazing how his power and relevance is felt today. I'll give one example, September 22nd, 2016. His poem, I Too, was printed on a full page of the New York Times in response to the rare upheaval the previous day in Charlotte. North Carolina. Let me read it to you. I too sing America. I am the darker brother. They send me to eat in the kitchen when company comes, but I laugh and eat well and grow strong. Tomorrow I'll be at the table when company comes. Nobody will dare say to me, eat in the kitchen. Besides, they'll see how beautiful I am and be ashamed. I too am America. Let me conclude with how Paul, incredibly relevant as we speak. It's a long poem and I'll only read parts of it. <clears throat> well, let America be America again. Uh, the irony is <clears throat> that this is Langston Hughes' black perspective on the potential greatness of America, <clears throat> the America that was born in a visionary dream, but has not yet fulfilled that dream. Um, supporters of Donald Trump take a very different perspective on make America great again. Here is Langston Hughes, the most prominent black poet probably in our literary history. Let America be America again. Let it be the dream it used to be it be the pioneer on the plain, seeking a home where he himself is free. America never was America to me. Let America be the dream the dreamers dreamed. Let it be that great, strong land of love, where kings connive nor tyrants scheme that any man be brushed by one above. It never was America to me. Oh, let my land be a land where liberty is crowned with no false patriotic wreath, but opportunity is real and life is free. Equality is in the air we breathe. There's never been equality for me, nor freedom in this homeland of the free. 
Who are you that mumbles in the dark? And who are you that draw a veil across the stars? I am the poor white fool pushed up. I am the Negro bearing slavery scars. I am the red man from the land. I am the immigrant clutching, clutching the hope I seek and finding only the same old stupid plan of dog, dog of mighty crop the weak. I am the young man full of strength and hope tangled in that ancient this chain of profit, power, gain of grab the land, grab the gold, of grab the ways of satisfying need, of work the men, of take the pay, of owning everything for one's own greed. The free? Who said the free? Not me. Surely not me. The millions on relief today? The millions shot down when we strike? The millions who have nothing but our pay? for all the dreams we've dreamed and all the songs we've sung and all the hopes we've held and all the flags we've hung, the millions who have nothing for our pay except the dream that's almost dead today. Oh, let America be America again. The land that never has been yet and yet must be. The land where every man is free, the land that's mine, the poor man's, Indians, Negroes, me. America, whose sweat and blood, whose faith and pain, whose hand at the factory, whose plow in the rain must bring back our mighty dream again. Oh yes, I say it plain. America never was America to me, and yet I swear, oh, America will be out of the rack and ruin of our gangster death the rape and rot of graft and stealth and lies. We, the people, must redeem the land, the mines, the plants, the river, the mountains, and the endless plain, and all the stretch of these great green states, and make America again. Thank you. We have some minutes, Chris. Uh, any thoughts, or comments, or questions? Yeah, I have a question. Did he and Paul Robinson know each other? You know, it's an interesting question. Uh, I'm sure they must have had interaction, uh, but it doesn't occur in any of his. Um, to autobiographical accounts. Uh, as I think you know, Paul Robeson also uh, was passionately involved in the same causes. Was I'm not sure Robeson was actually, I don't think Robeson was a member of the Communist Party, but he certainly was a strong sympathizer. Uh, just as Langston Hughes ran into serious problems with the McCarthy investigation, Paul Robeson had his passport revoked. He was not allowed to leave the country. Um, his career was uh, crushed. Um, he uh, lived his last years in painful bitterness. Unlike Hughes, who uh, did not suffer the same consequences for his left-wing views and affiliations. Um, but it's a very interesting question, and I, I will do some more research on that to see if there was a, a personal interaction or relationship between them. Paul is, right? Paul, uh, thank you. Is, is he an influence now? How is he viewed now? How is he? How is he perceived now? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> I uh, urged everybody to look up Let America Be America Again at, at the height of <clears throat> the turbulence that we've all witnessed uh, over the past few years. <clears throat> uh, 
view, I'm sure, familiar with probably the most successful Black play ever written in America, Lorraine Spurry's The Raisin in the Sun. The title is taken from a poem by Langston Hughes. What happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun? I don't know the rest of the poem, but it ends. Or does it explode? Short poem, but dynamic. Uh, Langston Hughes had a very warm, friendly relationship with uh, Lorraine Hansberry. Uh, and one of the most significant black writers of the post-war era. She died quite young. I don't think she was more than 38, but she died of cancer. Uh, a Raisin in the Sun is by far the most successful black play ever written in America. Uh, so the fact that the New York Times would take that poem, I too, and print it on an entire page after the racial upheaval in Charlotte, North Carolina, uh, said something about its relevance. Um, there were poems I'm going to read if we had time on about, <laughs> as a matter of fact, uh, we have, Chris, we have a couple of minutes. Uh, uh, let me read you this poem that's <laughs> surely uh, going to resonate with anybody who is aware of the current situation in America. It's called Who But the Lord? I looked and I saw the man called the law. He was coming down the street at me. I had visions in my head of being laid out cold and dead or else murdered by the third degree. I said, oh Lord, if you can, save me from that man. Don't let him make a pulp out of me. But the Lord, he was not quick. The law raised a stick and beat living hell out of me. Now, I do not understand why God don't protect a man from police brutality, being poor and black. I've no weapon to strike back. So who the Lord and protect me? We'll see. <clears throat> the other poem is about refugee. <clears throat> Uh, one of the key issues of <clears throat> the 2016 campaign, one of the key issues now, is the whole issue of immigration. Uh, let me conclude <clears throat> by reading this. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello? Yes. Okay. I lost the image. I lost the screen. But if you can still hear me, <clears throat> let me read this poem. It's called Song of the Refugee Road. Refugee road, refugee road, where do I go from here? Weary my feet, heavy the road, my heart is filled with fear. The ones I left far behind, home nowhere. Dark winds of trouble moan through my mind, none to care. Bitter my past, tomorrow, what's there? Refugee road, refugee road. Where do I go from here? Walking down the refugee road, must I beg, must steal? Must I lie, must I kneel? Or driven like dumb war weary sheep? Must we wander the high road and weep? Or will the world listen to my appeal? From China, where the war gods thunder and roar, from all the dark lands where freedom is no more, Verona, Vienna, city of light and gladness, once gay with waltzes, now bowed in sadness. Dark Ethiopia stripped of her mirth, Spain where the shells plant steel seeds of the earth. Oh, statue of liberty, lighting tomorrow, look and have pity on my sorrow. Home, nowhere, none to care. Bitter my past, tomorrow, what's there? Refugee road, refugee road, where do I go from here, walking down that refugee road?
Thank you. Sorry, I lost the I lost the screen. I thank you all for tuning in, and um, I look forward to seeing you at some point in hopefully the near future. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much, Larry. Thank you. It was thank excellent. You. Thank, thank you, you so much. much. Yeah. Okay. <laughs>